and, and I was totally undeserving of it. We are, we are rapidly heading into some, in, into some new, new territories, new things that are happening, and, and uh, maybe our election yesterday may have turned us into a positive direction. We'll know that over the months to come, but uh, we, we are, we are in, in, in new waters, new, new, new adventures, new things, and and uh, Jesus is soon to come back. I, I believe that. And um, we are under what is now, the, there's two classes of people in the world, Jew and Gentile, that's all. There's nothing else, just Jew or Gentile. You, you're either one or the other. You're either, you're either born of the natural seed of Abraham or you're born a Gentile. And when you're born again, you become the adopted seed of Abraham. And you have all the same birthrights as a natural seed. And uh, in fact, sometimes uh, an adoption really uh, can mean a little bit more than, than a person naturally born because a person could be naturally born and not really be wanted. But a person that's adopted is for sure wanted or they wouldn't have been adopted. They wouldn't have had to have adopted them. So there's actually a, a, a special... Uh, thing that that is an, in adoption, and uh, we are we we have been under Gentile world rule or dominion now since A.D. 70, and uh, after that time, when when war came into Jerusalem, and the prophecy of Jesus when he said not one stone would be left upon another, and the the invading armies came against Jerusalem and and tore that city completely down. And uh, from that time, we have been under Gentile rule and Gentile dominion. Uh, if you go back into the beast, or, or not to the beast, but to the image of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2 and 3, when, when Daniel built, built that image, or D Daniel told about that image of Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> he said the head was of gold. And then the materials all the way down on that image deteriorated in value till they got to the feet and they blended the feet with uh, with clay and and with with metal material and if if any part if any part of our uh, building is going to be uh, compromised on you never want to compromise on the foundation and so Gentile world Dominion came in in 8070. And in A.D. 70, uh, they begin that building of that image of Nebuchadnezzar. And we are coming down to the time that we're seeing now that the materials of the end, the iron and clay, are not sticking together. Uh, we've got problems in the United Nations. We've got problems in, all around the world. And, and things are dissolving. They're coming apart. And uh, so the next thing when you got down to the feet of the image was that there was to be a stone cut out of the mountain without hands come rolling down through Babylon. Babylon means confusion. And that's where we are right now. And when Jesus comes back, he is the stone that's cut out of the mountain without hands. And when he comes rolling down through Babylon, when he strikes that image, which is the world systems, they're going to crumble. They're not going to be able to stand. They're going to crumble. And they're going to fall. And we are right in that time right now. Now Israel is God's timepiece. We all know that, right? Israel is God's timepiece. And if you want to know what's going on, you can't just watch the, around the globe and see just everything that's going on. Though Jesus said, watch this sign and that sign and different signs. And when you see these things and you're going to know that the end is, is nearing, he also had a lot to say about the nation of Israel and how the nation of Israel would be what would be happening at the time that um, he returned back to the earth again. In fact, he said that when you see Israel go back and become a nation, he said this generation shall not pass away until all things be fulfilled. Now, I was born uh, 11 months before uh, the, the uh, rebirth of the nation of Israel. It happened in May of 1948. And that was really the, 
the the uh, threshing floor of the th- the threshold that was to take us right out to the end of the age. And he said, when you see these things, you're going to know that you are right at the time of the Lord's coming. I'm going to read some verses tonight in Ezekiel 37, beginning verse 1. Uh, Duane read some of these verses on Sunday morning. And uh, so, anyway, I'm going to go there tonight. And these are powerful, powerful verses, and they have a twofold meaning. We could take them and we could use them as, as meaning the church and people that are born to God. But the direct meaning of these verses is the nation of Israel and uh, the rebirth. Of the, of the nation that was going to be reborn and was reborn in 1948. Beginning verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 37. And the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out into the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley full of bones and causeth me to pass by them about, round about. And behold, there were, there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry the bones were very dry which means they've been dead for a long long time that whenever you begin to see this valley of bones coming back to life there'd be a long lapse of time between the time they died and the time the resurrection of those bones came and there was almost 19 about 1900 years that lapsed between the destruction of Jerusalem and until the time that Israel became a nation again. That's a long time. And the bones were exceeding dry. They were extremely, extremely dry. Verse 3 said, And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered him, O Lord God, thou knowest. And he said to me, Prophesy unto the bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of of the Lord. Now, what he is saying is, is that the time will come that Israel as a nation would hear the word of God and there would be life that could come back into death because of the power of the spoken word of God. Now, you, uh, uh, the Bible said in the book of John chapter 6, 63, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If there's anything going to bring life back to Israel after all this 19 centuries of being dead, it's going to be them hearing the Word of God. Even though they may not even know they're hearing it, time and events are hearing the Word of God, and things are going to fulfill just like God has predicted or God has prophesied that they're going to come to pass. Then he said, Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to come into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, up until this time that they are resurrected back to life, Israel has not known who the Lord is. They've not known God, and and, uh, the fulfillment of them knowing Him will come In the 12th chapter of the book of Zechariah, at the time he returns back, and they begin asking questions like, where did you get the nail prints in your hands? And Jesus will say, I got them in the house of my friends. Now, the Jews did not know him all during that period of time. They had rituals of worship. They went through modes of worship, and they, they did a lot of things of worship, but they did not know who the Lord was, But the Bible said, you shall know that I am the Lord. There's going to come that moment after the resurrection of Israel that they're going to know who the Lord is. They're going to have a return back to God. And during the millennium especially, that's going to be a great great time for Israel's return back to God. He said, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise... And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone of his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them around, uh, skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, 
come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Do you remember the language of Acts 2 when the Holy Ghost came? The Bible said there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. The wind is the breath of God. And when God breathes that breath over that people of Israel that's been dead, all of a sudden things are going to start taking place. Now verse 10 said, So I prophesied as, I w as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. Israel returned back to their homeland beginning in, in May of 1948. Up until 1967, 20 years later in May of 1967, there was a great war fought in Jerusalem that lasted six days. And up until that time, Jerusalem was under Gentile control. And the book of, of uh, Luke chapter 21 said that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So what was, had to happen was after Jerusalem or Israel became a nation again, Jerusalem had to go back from being a Gentile dominion to a Jewish dominion, and they fought a war that lasted six days and was not expected to win that war. They thought there was no way that they could fight against all those nations over there and come out with the ownership of, of Jerusalem, and they could not have. The difference was it was time for the Word of God to be fulfilled. And when it comes time for God's Word to be fulfilled, you can rest assured it's going to happen just like God said. Just like God said. So, like for young people that are here and, and those that, that don't un, maybe, maybe don't completely understand, when God says something, just as sure as it was for Israel, when God told them that they would come back and they would become a nation again, it took 1,900 years for that to fulfill. But it fulfilled just like God said. And whenever God says something, it's going to come to pass. For example, when he said, I'm going to come back as a thief in the night to the world that doesn't expect me. He's going to come back whether we believe it or not. Does it make any difference if we're ready or not ready? If we're accepting of him or not accepting of him? He's going to return back after his people. You believe that? I believe that. He's going to come back after his own. Now, Israel is God's timepiece. We depend on timepieces. You get up in the morning, and if you've got to be on a job at a certain time, you know to set your alarm or your clock to get you up at a certain time. You watch the clock. If you've got to be to work at 7 and you're 20 minutes away, you know that you've got to be gone by 6.30 or so in order to get there on time. You watch the timepiece. The timepiece tells you whether you've got time to arrive on time or you're going to be late. Watches tell us that time. Our cell phones tell us that time. Our iPads tell us that time. Years ago when we didn't have all that, we had sundials. And people would follow the time. may not have been exactly accurate, but it wasn't very far off. They were able to know and recognize the time by the sundial because the sun is always right. We may not be right, our watch may not be right, but the sun is always right. So they developed sundials many, many years ago, and they could use that to know when it was high noon or when it was 6 o'clock in the afternoon or whatever the time was. Israel to the church is our timepiece. When we watch Israel, we know how close we are to the coming of Jesus by the events that are taking place in the Mideast. Back several years ago, about time that Jerusalem uh, was overtaken by the Jews and became under Jewish domain again, the Jews began to just sell out and move back by masses. Thousands and tens of thousands of them were just selling out everything and going back. And I'll never forget hearing some of them interviewed at the airport and they were asked questions like, why are you going back? And they'd say, we don't know why we're going. We don't understand why we're going. There's just something drawing us that we have to do it. Well, that something was prophecy. That was the word of God being sent to a valley of dry bones. That was the breath of God blowing across them and getting them in a position to be ready. 
In the book of Hosea, chapter 6, and verse 1, Hosea picks up on this and tells us when we can expect Israel to start coming back to be a nation again. See, it was told to us in, in, in Ezekiel that at the time that God would return, that they would have been so long dead that the, that the valley would be full of bones that were extremely dry, very dry bones, meaning it would be a long period of time. Not just a little while. They weren't going to be gone just for a little while, and, and then in a little while it would all, you know, all kind of pan out. But it was going to be a long, long period of time. All right? Now, Hosea picks up and he says this, O come, and let us return unto the Lord. This is talking about the nation of Israel. They're saying, let us return unto the Lord, which means there comes a time that they recognize that they are away from God and they need God. They need a return back to God. So they say, let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn, but he will heal us. He hath smitten us, but he will bind us up. God had smitten them. The judgment of God had come, and had come against the nation of Israel. But Israel recognized that if they will return to God in faith, that God will both heal them and God will bind up their injuries. Don't you find God that way in your life? That when you make mistakes or failures or you fall short of the kingdom of God, if you'll come repenting or returning back to God, that God is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and unrighteousness? What if he wasn't? If he wasn't, there wouldn't be one of us here today. If he wasn't faithful in forgiving us, not one of us would be here. All right, so he said, if we'll return unto the Lord, God will do that. Now notice what he said in verse 2. After two days will I revive thee, and in the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. So what he is saying is, is that, there will be approximately two days or 2,000 years that will pass between the time that Israel became, Jerusalem was overthrown, and the time that Israel became a nation again. So how long was it? It was over 1,900 years, two approximate days. Two 1,000 years days lapsed, and then God began to bring them back and get them ready for a great revival that's going to happen among them. And a revival is going to come among them. Notice what he said in verse 3. Then shall you know, if you follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is preparing as the morning. And he shall come to us as the rain, as the, early, as the latter and the former rain upon the earth. We are now in the time of the latter rain of God. We've come through some great days, and great days are still here for the people of God, but I think we are, uh, we are in a position that sometimes people have to be pressed before they produce. And we are at ease in Zion, and there's a lot of relaxation going on in Zion, and God, if necessary, is going to bring pressure to the church for her to produce what he wants them to produce. In the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, he said, the earnest expectation of the whole creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. They could come into our audience and they can deny our preaching. I told you that not long ago, I was preaching for my friend in New Mexico. And while I was preaching, a man jumped up uh, of the Navajo Indian Reservation and he didn't believe in Jesus. And he jumped up and he started saying, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's all a lie. Don't believe anything he's saying. And he started running for the door. And as he went out the door, he said, it's all a lie. Don't believe it. Well, the fact is, he didn't believe it, but that doesn't change it. Whether he believes it or not doesn't change the truth of God. But we're in the latter rain, and we can expect God to begin to put some pressure on the church to produce. You know, back in biblical times when they would take grapes and put them in a vat, they would take them and put them in a vat, and they would leave them there. You, you know how that somebody would get in there and walk on them to press out the juices. But before they did that, they left the grapes in there for a day or two for the voluntary uh, 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 grape juice to come out of the grapes. It didn't have to be pressed out. It came out voluntarily. 
Now, what that which came out voluntarily was not called grape juice. It was called glucose. How many knows what glucose is? Yeah. If you get real sick, you go to the hospital, they give you glucose. Glucose was the grape juice that yielded from itself without it being pressed out of them. God wills that we would serve him because we love him. God wills that we would produce the will of the kingdom of God and we would do the works of the kingdom of God in the New Testament simply because we love him. But if we fail to do that, he will press us into a position that the works of God will be done. For if we don't praise him, the rocks and the mountains will cry out. God will have his work done. Amen? God will have his work done. And so somebody is going to praise the Lord. Somebody's going to magnify the Lord. I was thinking the other day of a verse that I haven't thought on probably for a long, long time where God said, I will shake everything that can be shaken. I will shake the heavens and I will shake the earth. Now, when he says the heavens and the earth, doesn't mean he's going to reach up there and grab the stars and start shaking them. It means the heavenly body, the church, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. And God is doing that right now. And if we're looking at the pages of God's Word and seeing the fulfillment of the prophecies of God's Word, and that isn't getting our attention, the love of God doesn't want you to perish. And if God needs to put pressure on you for you to wake up to His call and His need, He will do that. Now, Israel was a nation that was dead that had to come back to life. They were dead 1,900 plus years they did not have a nation. How did that happen? It had never happened before in the pages of history. There is no history of any civilization ever completely dying and coming back to life again. Am I right, Ray? Never before. Never a nation that became totally non-existent and went for years and years did they ever fly the flag over that country again. But they did in Israel. They did in Israel. And that had been gone for many, many years. The Hebrew language had died and been non-existent for uh, centuries. The, the language had not been used, had not been spoken. And now if you go to Israel, you hear the Hebrew language being spoken. It is resurrected. God resurrected a nation, resurrected their love for their nation, resurrected their language, and God has them in position for a great outpouring of the power of God. Their language was resurrected, and what was happening was the Word of God was speaking to the nation that was to be our timepiece. Now, God has announced uh, to us back in Ezekiel 36, He had already previously announced that Israel was going to become a nation again. Before He says uh, the Valley of Dry Bones, and says, go prophesy to them and they come back to life, God has already said the time's going to come that they're going to be restored. Go to, uh, to Ezekiel 36, verse 24. Notice what he said. And I, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. The Jews were scattered abroad throughout the entire world. Interesting that in World War II, how many estimated 6 million Jews were, were massacred, if not more? Six, was it 6 million, Ray? 6 million estimated that were murdered, burned, beheaded, killed, tortured in unbelievable ways, and possibly many more than that. But estimated 6 million of them were put to death. Isn't it interesting that when when the war ended that killed so many of them, 18 months later, Israel's flag begins to fly again, and they become a nation. They're recognized as a nation again. 18 months after that war ended. Now, he said, I'm going to bring you back into your own land, and I'm going to have to gather you out of all the countries of the earth in order to do that. And they begin to draw like magnetic forces out of Russia and Germany and all over Europe and America and all the nations of the world, they begin to come back to their homeland. It wasn't just happen uh, stance that, that that took place. 
It was the fulfillment and the drawing power of the word of God that was speaking in them. Verse 25, And I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean, and all your filthiness, uh, I'll clean, uh, clean, you'll be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart I will give you. A new spirit I will put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, uh, out, of, out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. Verse 28. And you will dwell in the land that I gave unto your fathers, and you uh, shall be my people, and I will be your God. Now back in the book of Genesis, the land of Israel that we know now was given unto Abraham and to his seed for how long? The Bible said forever. Nobody could own that that they wanted to take back. I know right now there's uh, uh, rumors that war may start back to try to recapture Jerusalem and all of those things. But I'm here to tell you that when you start fighting against Israel, you're fighting a losing battle. Fighting a losing battle. In fact, the Bible speaks of the time that America will fight against Israel. Today we're an ally, but we will turn our forces against Israel. Every nation in the world will. The Bible said all nations of the earth will begin to fight against Israel. Now, as a small nation as they are, they could never fight against all the nations of the world. But you know what God said I'll do? He said, I'll put my hand over you. And I'll protect you. And then he said, I'll put my feet down upon the Mount of Olives and I'll split that mountain. And you can run into that mountain. And when you flee into that mountain, I will fight for you as I fought for you in the day of judgment. You could fight good against Israel, but you can't fight very good against God. When you raise up hand against God, you're a loser before you start. You believe that? Amen. You're a loser before you start. There's no way to be in a contest against God. Now Ezekiel 36, 33 said, Thus saith the Lord God in the day that I shall cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause you to dwell in your cities, and the waste uh, uh, shall be built. And the desolate land, everybody say desolate land, shall be tilled whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. Prior to 1948, basically no one lived in the land of Israel. Nobody wanted to live there. You know why? Because it was considered a desolate, useless parcel of ground. It was not believed that it would produce anything. I've read articles about how that uh, no nation really wanted it. It, it. it was worthless. So when Israel made an effort to reclaim it back, it really wasn't a big contest to get it because nobody really wanted it because it was a desolate land. What they did not realize was it was some of the most fertile soil on the globe. Some of the most fertile soil on the globe. All it needed was irrigation. And when they irrigated that land, it can produce more than about any land uh, anywhere else on the earth. Israel was for centuries an undeveloped land, and it was considered a desolate land land. Verse 35, and they shall say this land was desolate. This land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden. Israel, acre for acre, can outproduce any other region of the world. They can outproduce. Their land is fertile. Their land is good. And he said, those that dwell around, the, those who walk by and said the land is desolate, would look upon it later and say, how did this land become like the Garden of Eden? How did it become so productive? Well, I'll tell you how it became productive. When the wind of God blew across it, and the voice of God said, come alive, life came into death. Life comes into death with you when God speaks it into you. But if God doesn't speak it into you, it's never going to be in you. Now, notice on what he said. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities, they become fenced, and now they're inhabited. Then the heathen 
that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, built the ruined places and, uh, and plant that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. I have said it, and you can be sure it's going to come to pass just like I spoke it. It's going to happen. Now, God gives a vision of how that's going to come to pass. In the book of Ezekiel 37 and verse 11, he gives Ezekiel a vision of how that's going to be accomplished. And he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off from all parts. Now, the bones were the whole house of Israel. I don't have to build an assumption on what that is. God tells us what it is. But God said they're going to live because I spoke it and I'm going to do it. <clears throat> now, if you went back 1930s and you were to ask somebody in the 1930s, do you believe Israel will become a nation again? If they were not into prophecy of the Bible, they'd have said, no, it'll never happen. They're just a little group of people here and there and all over the world, and it'll never happen. But it did happen. You know why? Because God said, I spoke it, and it will come to pass. I spoke it. I don't know how everything's going to play out in the end of the world. But I know one thing, God spoke it, that he's coming back. And he's going to come back whether I understand all the details or not. Whether I've got all my, do my I's dotted and my T's crossed doesn't make any difference. The fact is, when he is ready to come, he's going to come. Give him thanks here tonight, will you? Now, the bones are the whole house of Israel, and the graves that he's talking about are the nations that they've been buried in. Not literally buried, but where the Jews were residing all over the world, whether it be Russia, Germany, America, uh, West Indies, no matter where they lived, God said, they're going to come out of their graves because they're dying in a strange land. And I'm going to bring them back to the land that I have promised them and to the land that I've given them. So Israel was without a nation, had no country, dwelled in all the nations of the earth. They were called disrespectful as Jews and looked down on. And uh, when they were looked down on, that didn't change the fact that God had a prophetical word already spoken for them. And God's going to bring them back together and out of death as a nation they're going to experience he says here a resurrection and that resurrection as we've already said happened on May 14th 1948 when they flew that flag of Israel again and for the next 20 years they had a nation but did not have their capital city they had a nation but Gentiles still rule over the city of Jerusalem but that had to change too because Jesus left that prophecy that the Gentiles would be driven out of that area. Now, I want to show you the order of the procedure in about the next 10 minutes uh, that God promised them that was going to happen for them. He sent them a word in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 12. Number one, he said he was going to bring them out. Notice here what he said. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves. He is saying to them, When it comes time, even nations that would not let you easily commute from nation to nation, they're going to give you the liberty to leave that nation and go back to Israel. I'm going to make the way. I'm going to open the door. And uh, uh, I, remember, I remember watching that in 1967 uh, and 68. I was preaching up through northern uh, Indiana, through Rochester and Indianapolis and South Bend and up through that part of the country at that time. And I was up there preaching when Israel overtook uh, Jerusalem 
and reclaim their capital city. All of a sudden, they began showing on news telecasts all over the world. They interviewed people in Russia, and, and they asked them questions about how were they getting out of the country under the communist rulership of, of Russia. And Russian diplomats and leaders were saying, we don't really know why we're letting them go. We're just letting them go. I'll tell you why. Because the word of the Lord had spoken, and it had to come to pass. It had to come to pass. Just like God said it had to happen, I'm going to bring you out. And then he said in the second part of that verse, he said, and bring you into the land of Israel. God said, I'm going to bring you back in. I'm not only going to bring you out into no man's land, I'm going to take you back and put you in the land that I gave to your fathers. When God gave Abraham that land, he told him, he said, all the land that your eyes look upon, you're going to have it. And your seed is going to become so great that they're going to become like the sands of the seas and the stars of the sky. What do I use the metaphor of the sand of the sea and the stars above? Because he knew God's prophecy was that there would be a time that the seed of Abraham would be twofold. It would be a natural seed and a spiritual seed, an earthly seed and a heavenly seed. The heavenly seed would be those who are born through Jesus Christ, adopted into the family of God, and the earthly seed would be born physically. But all of them would be here with a promise. And I'm going to give you that seed, he said. I'm going to bring you out, and then I'm going to bring you in. Then number three, he said, you're going to experience a conversion. You're going to have a conversion. Notice verse 13. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. You're going to know who I am when I bring you out of those graves. You know what? I'm not very smart, but I'm smart enough to know if I was dead in a grave and somebody brought me out, who would do it? You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to be able to figure that out. And, and the Lord says... Right now, you don't know me because you're scattered in your graves. But when I bring you out, you're going to recognize this is God. This is God's Word. It's amazing. Um, God is doing something among the Jews. And, and um, what He's doing is priming their heart, getting them ready for a great reviving that will happen once He's taken the church out. Now, there'll be a remnant of Israel that will be ready to go. They'll be repented and baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost and ready to go at the time of the rapture of the church. They're going to be ready. But by and at large, most of them will come with their reviving time after the church has raptured and God turns back to open the eyes of the Jew. That's when most of them will have their time of, of return to God. At that time, I believe that there will come an Antichrist that will make a covenant with them for seven years. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And after he's made that covenant with them, in the middle of that week, those Jews will figure out, we have been deceived. This is not the Messiah. This is a false Messiah. And they will rebel against him and rise up against him, and all hell then will break loose against the Jew. God has a people, and he's going to bring them out and going to bring them in. And he said, when I bring you in, you're going to know that I am God. And you're going to know that it's God that's brought you out of your graves. It wasn't your own engineering. It wasn't your own ingenuities. It wasn't your own power, your own might. It was the power of the Word of God that has brought you out of your graves. Then he said, when I bring you out of your graves, I'm going to infill you with my Spirit. In verse 14, he said, I will put my Spirit within you and you shall live and shall place you in your own land. You will know that I'm the Lord that I, the Lord, that you'll know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to put my spirit in you. You're going to live. I'm going to take you to your own land, and then you're going to know that I am the Lord. See, God came to the Gentiles in the grace dispensation for a 2,000-year span, two days. Yet he said the third day he's going to return back 
for the nation of Israel. Let me read for you in the book of Acts chapter 15 and verse 14. Acts chapter 15, verse 14. And I'm going to read about three verses right here. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Now God came to the Gentiles 2,000 years ago to take out of them a people for his name. Amen. I, I love the name of Jesus. I'm glad I've got that name upon me and within me. And I submitted and yielded to that name. It's a name I repented in. It's a name I found God and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in. There is no other name. And that name is a glorious name. And God did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. You believe that, don't you, Harley? Yes, sir. You heard that before, haven't you? Yeah. It's something about that name. That's a powerful name. As long as the Gentiles are here and coming to Christ through his name, then there's going to be a limited movement of God among the Jew. But once God has come and taken this church out of here for his name, then he's going to turn back to them. Now notice what he said, verse 15. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. To this agree, the prophets, he said, agree to this. Verse 16, after this, after what? After he has taken this church out of this earth for his name, out of the Gentiles, after this, I will build again the tabernacle of David that is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and will set it up. God is going to rebuild the nation of Israel in his spirit world and in the power of his kingdom at the, at the time of the rapturing out of the church. Now, I don't know where you stand in all this, but I want to get out of here. They call that, I, we went through a period of time back 10 years ago or so, and, and folks would always say, oh, that's escapism mentality. And I, I would hear folks say that, and you know what? I try to figure out uh, what does that mean? Because I thought that's what we've come to God for. I, when I came to God, you know why I came to God? Because I wanted to escape hell. You know why I surrendered to God? Because I wanted to escape this world before it burn up. I wanted to get out of here. Would I have come to God if I hadn't believed there was a hell? I don't know whether I would have or not. But I can tell you one thing. I believed in it enough to know that I didn't want to go there. And I knew that I wanted to serve God. Now... I came to God probably more because I feared Him. But I serve Him today more because I love Him. But I'm not going to be like some folks who say, I don't any longer fear God because I've changed from fear to love. I still fear God. I still fear God. That's why I try to keep His commandments. Because the Bible said to fear God and keep His commandments is the beginning of wisdom. And I don't want to meet God as a fool. I'd like to meet God with some wisdom ready to be gone back so Simon hath declared to this all the prophets agree he said God visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name and all the prophets will agree to this he said that after this I'm going to build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof the tabernacle of David is going to be rebuilt you know who Jesus was? He was the root and the offspring of David. The root is there before the vine, which means that Jesus is both the father and the son of David. Both father and son. He was David's father, and he was David's son. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, what a wonderful... Now, you see, this may not mean anything to you. I don't know whether it means anything to you or not means a lot to me because when I read about this, this tells me that I'm right on the brink of something exciting. Right on the brink of something happening and who knows maybe today maybe tonight might be my night that I get to escape right out of here because the word of God has said it. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you. You are wonderful. You're kind. You're loving. 
I thank you for all that you've done for us. And I thank you for your blessings, God. I want you, God, just to flow into our hearts and flow into our spirits and, and help us to know and understand that your ways are perfect. And, God, that we can serve you in the beauty of your word and know the life that you've given us and how glorious and wonderful it is. I ask you, O oh God, to just bless every person that's in this building tonight. God, I, I don't understand the people that, that say they love you, but they don't love you enough to follow you. They don't make a, they don't make a, a, a plot to be under the house of God. When you set for us to assemble ourselves together, and even more as you see the day approaching, help us, God, that we can serve you, that we can follow you, that we can do your will. And we'll thank you for all those blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God is sure.